you take up the retention gap question in the Now I think, uh, go first to the last, last but not least, that leads to introduce to David Simmons, Managing Director, the Capital Science and Policy Practice of World's Powers, Watson. He's a pioneer in the development of models to understand frequency and severity of cat hazards and their impacts. Looking through the list of he has been involved, and I thought maybe you should uh, give a list that he was not involved in. <laughs> African risk capacity, the Crips and Pacific Cat Risk Insurance, the Philippine City Disaster Insurance Group, and currently he's working on schemes to help the people in Fiji. Thank you very much. Um, firstly, I should say I had four desserts, not three, so I need you on that Oh, right. Sorry, it was off. Um, so I have four desserts for dinner. I, I love Turkish desserts, I love desserts, and my waistline shows, unfortunately. It's a shame, it was a pleasure and a privilege to be last. It's a pleasure because it's much of which I was going to say has already been said, which means I have to speak less, which is good for you, because you don't have to hear me droning on for too long. I'm going to try and talk again about examples. You've heard a lot of theory. I think it's important to understand how that theory can be applied. The examples which I'm going to show you are not a limitation of what can be done, they're examples of what can be done. And it's one thing I think we are getting much better at at the insurance industry, including our capital market friends, is being very creative. We can actually work with you to design something which is appropriate for you. It's not like a cookie cutter where you have to buy something off the shelf, we would just sit down and work with you to design something that works for you and your particular needs. Right, I, I started working in the catastrophe reinsurance markets about 35 years ago and quite quickly I thought I made a terrible mistake. And the reason for that is we look like we're going bust. Why we look like we're going bust is because we were writing massive risks. Uh, in excess of a million dollars, a billion dollars occasionally, with little understanding of what we were covering and what, what the risk was. This led, about 30 years ago, to the beginning of a burgeoning of scientific engagement and model building. To the extent now that we, are pretty, we're pretty, we think we're pretty good at understanding where risks are and how exposed they are and what the events could be. We're not perfect. If you think you've got a perfect model, you're a fool. Uh, but we are much, much, much better at it. We understand also what we don't know, which is very important. Um, now we have another problem in the global reinsurance markets. We have too much capital. We actually we are seen to be a good, strong industry. We, we've ridden through very bad years, like last year, with very few, if any, um, failures. So we actually are now seen to be a good, safe place to put money, and pension funds and other investors see us as a place, tasking risk is something they want to invest in, being non-correlating with other financial risks. So, what does that mean for you? That means a couple of things. It means actually, catastrophe reinsurance and insurance is probably as cheap as it's ever been. It's a very competitive market. And my job, I work with this Tarts Watson, we're not a reinsurer, insurer, like the others here, we're a broker. Our job is to go out there and find the cheapest deal for any particular transaction that we can get with good, proper markets, which include all the guys on here. In fact, I can probably guarantee at least two of these guys will be on every transaction we do, I would think. Um, I'm going to talk about a few examples. Um, Karina has already talked about CRIF, the Karen and Sassy Risk Insurance Facility. I was fortunate enough to be involved with that from the very start. And with this task, Watson and our broker to CRIF. African risk capacity also on this chart, and also the Pacific scheme, the three existing regional schemes. Now these are interesting, because these are the first time when we moved outside of our comfort zone. Our comfort zone is covering property. CRIF, ARC, and PCRIC don't cover property. They cover the need for cash immediately after an event. You've heard a lot about parametric covers. They're parametric covers. They make sure the money is there. So for CRIF, for example, not only do they guarantee to pay, and always have paid, within 14 days of events, within three days of events, a government will know exactly how much they're going to get. So they can begin to plan, they can actually begin to spend that money, knowing it's going to come. 
11 days later. African risk where I was also fortunate enough to be involved at the start, is interesting because they cover droughts in Africa. There, they, um, there's actually much greater emphasis on capacity exchange. So, that, as the name implies, a big part of this process is helping African governments understand their risk, model their risk, uh, and build contingency plans so that such that an event occurs, money received from our insurance company limited can be spent most efficiently, protecting the lives of their people and the livelihoods and their livelihoods as well. I'm going to talk a little bit now about a scheme in the Philippines, not the one that Karina talked about. Karina talked about the provincial scheme, but a, a more recent scheme looking at cities to provide emergency response funding for cities. City risk is actually very, very topical at the moment. This is work done by Lawyers of London, their City Risk Index. They've looked at risks across the entire spectrum, about 25 different types of risk for over 300 global cities. And it's, it, you can see how cities, which of course are growing, more and more people want to live in cities. Cities tend to be based near water, so they tend to be very cat exposed. They have the greatest concentration of risk. City risk is very important. You've seen a version of this slide before. I'm a magpie, I borrow slides from everybody. This is borrowed from Vivid Economics. It's similar to the earlier slide you saw from the World Bank, which is showing the need for money early on. And the city of the Picard scheme, which is the Philippines uh, uh, catastrophe disaster insurance pool, is actually PC dip. Well, the PC dip is actually designed to deliver money within two weeks of a disaster occurring to the city. Why is that important? That, that money can be used to clear the debris away, that money can be used to provide emergency shelter, that money may be used to reconnect electricity supplies, water supplies. The point is to get the city working again, get the economy running again. The longer you leave these things, the worse the damage is. So it's important to be very quick and get these things working quickly. I'll run through this. Now, this is a pool. This slide is rather difficult to see, I think the arrows haven't actually shown, come up hardly at all. But in fact, what we're saying is that rather than the city buying the road insurance policy, the cities club together and they create a pool. And we create something called a special purpose vehicle, a special insurance company, which issues policies to that to each city. This special insurance, uh, special, special purpose vehicle is actually partially owned by the city. So the cities have a say in how that, how that vehicle is run. And that vehicle then buys the reinsurance it needs from the global markets. So why is this important? There's a number of reasons. One of which Karina has already mentioned is price. It will be cheaper. It will be cheaper for each individual city. Now Karina talked to show this slide in a different way. She missed one element there, which is actually profit. So any insurance transaction you buy will include embedded profit for the, for the insurer, the stroke of the insurer. It also will include uncertainty load. So the fact is that the insurer doesn't know if you pay nothing in one year, the entire or the entire sum insured or somewhere in between. Yes, they can model the probability, but they don't actually know. Uh, if we introduce create a pool, then that pool company retains the bulk of that profit and that's uncertainty load. So that, that profit uncertainty load is not lost to the global markets, it's actually held for the benefit of the pool, pool, of the pool members. Yes, the pool has to buy reinsurance, but a much, much less reinsurance and they would actually buy the collective sums insured of all the individual policies. And then for the Philippines case study, which we're currently working on, that means that, that roughly the amount of premium, the other was premium, which is profit and uncertainty load, is actually reduced by 66%, two thirds. So actually that profit is held in the pool, which that can mean that that pool can actually offer better deals to its client members. So it's very important. This is a difference from the provincial scheme which is a direct insurance purchase, not a pool. So, the, the PC DIP, which is the, the scheme we're currently working on, uh, is due to go live in 2020. Currently 10 cities, so we have cities queuing up to join. It's covering tropical cyclone and earthquake with the idea to add flooding once modeling is available. This is actually, the, the project was, a, um, was put together by a consortium of which Willis Towns Watson was a member. Though it's actually led by RMS, who you heard from earlier, and the modelling is, is produced by RMS. And the important thing is, unlike the provincial scheme, where, cities, where provinces get almost like a set product, 
cities can choose how much they buy and what they buy. So we produce a tool for them which actually allows them to calculate uh, how, when they need payments and what, what type of probability they want to see payments, what type of probability they want to see a total payment, uh, how much, or how much premium they can afford. And we can tailor the products and they can play with this interactively. So within a couple of seconds, work out what happens if I want this thing to, have to, to uh, begin to pay every five years, what happens if I want it to pay every ten years. What happens if I want the maximum payments every 100 years, etc. You can just play to all the buttons and the premium comes up. So this is actually very flexible. Cities can actually work on something which actually is appropriate for them. And again, as part of the project, there's a lot of work with cities to look at historical events, look at actually what, how, what their response and their cost for those events was, look at what exposure they have on the ground, what type of expense they may wish to cover. So there's a lot of support went into each city to help them parameterize their own model. I'm going to sit through this. By the way, these slides, if you want these slides, you're very, well, just contact me or contact the organizers. It's very happy for you to take them away. Uh, I won't go through this part because the slide, the colors have come out of the, this is actually looking at the advantages of a parametric index. Yeah, that's, actually, it's mostly looking at the disadvantages of an indemnity product. You know, there's pincer, there's slow, there's slow speed because you have to settle the claim. There's less transparency because there's insurance companies interpreting the rules. Uh, there's less cost effective because the cost of all these things. Uh, but you have basis risk. But I could talk to you for hours about basis risk. There are ways we can counter it, there are ways we can minimize it. And in almost every case, the, the, the downside of basis risk is actually offset by, uh, by the, 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 the advantage of quick, fast payment and certainty of cover. Uh, this is a very similar slide uh, to which Andy showed before, which is actually how we propose to cover uh, earthquake within uh, within the uh, PC dip scheme. It's a little bit different from the Pacific Alliance cap on, in that we're not looking at that magnitude of earthquakes, where so where earthquake actually occurs, we're actually looking at ground shaking. So the, the USGS produces something called shake shake map, and we take data from shake maps to work out what the shaking is in each area of the city and then produce an index based on the comparative size of each of those areas of the city. So it's very tailored to the individual city's requirements. The structure of the pool can will vary. This is just an example. Um, in this particular case, the pool is at the centre of everything, offering insurance to cities, buying reinsurance from reinsurance capacity, which could include capital markets, it being advised about how it does that purchase by a reinsurance broker. Uh, it is managed by a board, which includes city representatives and representatives of national governments. And it receives, in this particular case, funding support from the Asian Development Bank to capitalise the pool. And potentially, though not yet, premium support from the national government to the poorer cities. So the benefits of a scheme like PCD, and again this is being looked at very closely by other cities, other countries in the ASEAN region, one in particular, um, is that one is the speed of payment which we've heard about before, and the other is the budget certainty. The cities are less dependent upon central government. Uh, central government money may come through, may not come through as much as they want. Even more true of overseas aid. Overseas aid often does come. If it does come, it comes late and very often it comes with less than was promised. So you actually begin to take control back to the cities. By having the whole process, cities understand far better what their risks actually are. They have tools available to them. Cat you know, catastrophe models, this is a financial model I showed you before, to help them understand and make appropriate risk-adjusted decisions about what appropriate responses should be. Not just about the insurance, but about a whole range of risk reduction measures and actually makes them more prepared. So this type of process is encourages the development of contingency plans. So uh, as a city, we'll, we'll think about how we're going to spend this money. So if you're thinking about how much money you need, you begin to think about how you're going to spend it. So it means actually the whole thing, responses can be much more seamless. Events occur, things happen, rather than people who are around decide what they're going to do. And of course they can share ideas. They can share ideas across the pool, across cities, and even share resources. A couple more examples, and we're aware of the sign. Um, there's a lot of interest at the moment around disaster insurance for the poor. Now, t 
typically insurance is a middle class thing. Okay, insurance is around people who have money to afford who can pay premiums. Insurance is for people who have things which have value, which can be assessed, and therefore damage can be assessed. But if a catastrophe happens, unfortunately it's the poor that typically suffer the most. Yes, they have less to lose, but they're much more vulnerable. So the, the World Bank particularly now is looking very strongly at insurance for the poor. And there's a few examples of this. Um, we're working with the IFC on a scheme in Fiji, which is due to go live on the 1st of November of this year. It was just actually agreed ye uh, yesterday, so we've got a very, very tight deadline. We've done a lot of work on it already. And the aim of this is using a, an existing model, which actually will pay out if there is a particular level of wind speed in a province of Fiji. So a particular province in Fiji has a Cat 3, a classification 3 wind speed, they get a certain payment, they get a classification Cat 4, a different payment, Cat 5, they get maximum payment. And when that payment is made, the money is then dispersed across identified families within the area. And this means those people can get up to 2,500 Fijian dollars to actually help them through the next few weeks. So it's kind of a livelihood percent of protection. These people don't have houses which have any value. They probably live in shacks, but they need to, they need to live. Their livelihood will be, will be interrupted. This is to try and help them through that process. We're also working, have been working for some time actually, on something called the Philippines Catastrophe Insurance Pool, PCIP. This was directly inspired by the Turkish Insurance Pool, which is TCIP. Uh, but recently, due to political pressure, partly from the bank and also within the Philippines, there has been a demand to add insurance for the poor to this as well. So with this particular scheme now, is, they begin to think, partly because the, uh, the president wants to see it, to actually to have not just a traditional insurance scheme for property and small medium enterprises, but also payments, and similar to the Fijian scheme for the poor. Now, the most common examples of this type of scheme, though, will probably be on the, the agricultural side. An interesting example here is actually the R4 program for the World Food Food Program. And we, we act as a we as advisor for the scheme in Ethiopia. And this is quite interesting because actually one issue around these schemes for the poor is who pays the premium. Now, the poor can't afford to pay it all. They may be able to pay some but they certainly can't pay at all. The R4 program has an interesting feature in that people can opt to work for their premium. So rather than pay a premium, they can do labour, perhaps to improve irrigation to their village, to dig wells, to actually just improve the environment in their area, so that rather than use that rather than pay a premium. Of course, that does imply donor finance, but actually gets them in a virtuous circle. I mean, an example in African risk capacity is a guy on the board of African risk capacity, insurance company limited, whose father is a subsistence farmer in Zimbabwe. He always told me the story that his father cannot afford to plant all his seeds because if the crop failed, he would have nothing left for the following year, nothing left for his family to eat. If we have an insurance scheme, and as, as like R4, an insurance scheme which actually tries to um, help the farmer to improve their methods, have better fertilizer, have better varieties of seed, then his yield goes up. That makes him more resilient. Next year he may plant more. If he has insurance, he knows he can plant all his seed, he doesn't actually have to set to plant 50%. He becomes more productive. So you may not be able to afford the premium in the first year, but the second year he's getting a little bit richer. Third year, hopefully, richer still. So there's a virtuous circle that moves on. Very quickly, I've been given the five minute warning sign, so I'm going to nip through this one. There's a lot of interest now around how we can use insurance to encourage protection of natural infrastructure and natural ecosystems. And that's partly got the principle whereby if a country signs up to, for example, a sustainable, sustainable fisheries policy, like the Coast Program in the Caribbean, which the US State Department is working on with our original support, um, in that particular case, if a, country, if a country does this, does agree to sign up to this policy and implements it, then they will be given insurance to protect against things they can't protect. And you can imagine the same for coral reefs. So if a, if a country agrees not to, to seek to limit the damage to a reef from uh, boats driving through it, fishermen dynamite fishing it, from uh, pollution runoff from the from farms or from the countryside, 
then they may be given insurance against the things they can't, they can't protect against, which will include tropical cyclones and potentially uh, uh, bleaching events. Quickly, Brazilian bonds have been mentioned. Um, cap bonds are great, but cap bonds actually hold the money in a, in a kind of a, a off, away, away from the recipient. Very often, if you want to build infrastructure, if you want to build infrastructure, you need the money straight away. But why not have a, a, a loan whereby you borrow money for the infrastructure? And if then an event happens either during the building phase or actually once a thing is built, which damages your assets, you have to do your loan is forgiven. So it's kind of a way of embedding insurance in the loan arrangement. So this again is something we can we can talk about. Um, very quickly, last two slides. Um, this is all so far been talking about the global reinsurance market. So where does your local market contribute to this? Well, there's quite a lot of areas the local markets can contribute. They can act as a fronting company. Actually, they have, they have the license to provide insurance in your country. So they actually act as a first, income, first um, insurer and then they may pass the risk to the international markets. But they do, they can, over time, as they get more comfortable with the risk, begin to retain more knowledge is transferred. Um, there's obviously opportunities to manage the scheme and provide advisory services around the scheme, accounting services, legal services around the scheme. The models which, should, which may be used to support a new national scheme can be made available to the international market. So for example, in the Philippines again, I'm going over to the Philippines in a month's time to launch a model called Oasis, where they're building an open access model, which is built effectively for the government, but will be ultimately available to anybody in the Philippines market. So there's a lot of actual ways which we can actually involve the local insurance industry. It isn't just something which guys from London, New York, Zurich, and Munich, and then Paris get involved with. You want to make sure you have local involvement as well. I should briefly mention the Insurance Development Forum. Um, as the Anne reminded me, I needed to. This is something actually which is, is a coming together of, I think it's over 40 of the leading re insurance and reinsurance companies insurance brokers such as ourselves, insurance societies, the World Bank and the UN, particularly the UNDP. Um, the idea is actually to find ways where we can actually facilitate this type of uh, um, process. Very often the issue is a lack of understanding, so we want to help, help countries engage, understand what their risks are, understand when risk transfer may be appropriate, if risk transfer is appropriate, what should it look like? It doesn't have to be insurance, as we said, it can be other, other methods as well, it can be a combination. But if there are problems, how can we get rid of that problem, how can we close the gap? If there's a lack of data, how do we collect data? If there's a lack of modelling, how do we build a model? If there's regulatory issues, how do we, how do we correct that? So all these issues, actually, we can actually try and break down the barriers and make it easier for countries to actually do, to do what is appropriate to protect their citizens and protect their finances. Uh, we're working very closely with donors on this. The Germans and the British have been mentioned. The UK has set up something called the Centre for Global Disaster Protection, which actually is a co-venture with the World Bank. And again, we're working closely with those guys. And the German government have the Insure Resilient Solutions Fund, which provides money for technical assistance. And again, the, the IDF Technical Assistance um, Group, which I'm part of, uh, led by Evo of um, Swiss Re, um, is is actually helping the Germans to actually identify pilot projects. So if you have any ideas for pilot projects, let me or any of the guys know. That's a uh, Munich also involved. So in summary, ensuring climate risk. It's very hard, so as we say in English, a no-brainer really. Uh, well, I realise there are issues, we'll come back to it. Uh, ensuring climate risk protects lives, protects livelihoods, protects property, protects company profits and jobs, increases the speed of economic recovery, increases food security, builds risk awareness in government, commerce and broad society, incentivizes risk, uh, risk appropriate productive behavior, uh, values natural infrastructure and builds a framework to protect it, encourages development of mature risk responsive insurance sector in your country, encourages overseas investment in infrastructure by de risking that investment, and encourages development of a thriving center of insurance related expertise. So, if we get this right, everybody wins. So that's the challenge, we just need to get it right. Thank you very much. <laughs>